I look at it as almost like top down or bottom up processing or, you know, inside out, outside in where, you know, the talk therapy is really helping somebody understand themselves, help them make changes, learn new skills. The neural feedback is going more underneath. It's going at the biology um, where it's actually helping the brain and the nervous system develop regulation. So both together is phenomenal um, and it really does enhance each other. Um, and a lot of our clients will say, actually, once they start neural feedback, Feedback, they do feel like more associ- associations, more connections, like more change just sort of happens um, along with the work that they're doing. But it also is a standalone, um, you know, so we we can use it to treat various conditions like trauma, anxiety, depression, um, concussions, you know, concussion injuries, ADHD. So even areas where, you know, psychotherapy doesn't have as strong of effectiveness like a concussion, you know, we can definitely build skills, we can help people cope, help people kind of manage and moderate time. Um, But the neurofeedback can directly target the concussion injury and get those cells to be healthier or the neurons to, you know, produce healthier activity, the connections to be forged in a healthier way. So it definitely is both. It definitely can be both. This is the Anthropology Podcast, the podcast where we optimize the bodies, brains, and lifestyles of entrepreneurs, go-getters, and world-changing innovators. Welcome to the Anthropology Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Megan Walker. As a naturopathic doctor and anthropologist, I optimize the health and performance of badass women working to change the world as entrepreneurs and go-getters. You know, people exactly like you. Your business, body balance, and inner badass, these are the themes we are exploring. So as many of you know, in my own clinical practice, one of the key things that I focused on was, in fact, the health of entrepreneurs and go-getters. And in addressing their health, we worked on first restoring issues that maybe had been pre-existing. Then we started to focus on health optimization. And ultimately, our goal was that we were optimizing the functionality of one's brain. And while we had a tremendous assortment of tools at our disposal in order to make that happen, my guest today is discussing one that for what whatever reason I had zero exposure to in my own practice. Dr. Michelle Presniak is a clinical psychologist and her particular focus is around the utilization of neurofeedback to help individuals move to a next level with respect to their brain health. She works with individuals who are managing depression or anxiety or even people who are looking to optimize their brain health by providing them with the feedback that they need to to start to move the neuroplasticity of their brain to the next level. Now, if this sounds like something that you have really no understanding of, you and me both. And what I said to Michelle at the beginning of our uh, of our interview was that I it was going to be very conversational. And what it turned into was me rapid firing all these unique thoughts and ideas and, and conditions and situations that I was hopeful she would say neurofeedback would be able to influence. And in nearly every case, she said that it could. I was deeply fascinated by this because I'm always interested in understanding how we can move the needle on brain health and anxiety and depression with out necessarily the use of pharmaceuticals, and Michelle has an abundance of answers. Whether you are looking to manage a situation or simply optimize the health of your own brain, I promise this conversation is going to be interesting and compelling for you. It is truly my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Michelle Presniak. Dr. Michelle Presniak, welcome to the Anthropology Podcast. Well, thank you, Megan. I'm so happy to be here. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. And, you know, in my own clinical practice, brain health was something that we focused on uh, tremendously. And we and we really started on a, on a foundational level, on a cellular level, and, and really unlocking people's lifestyle. And I love that you have a similar focus in your practice, but you're coming at it through an entirely different door. So you are a clinical psychologist and a uh, brain health expert. And today we're really going to be on Unpacking uh, neurofeedback is one of the modalities that you that you use in your practice and that you're an expert on. And I'm wondering if we can just get started with you sharing with people a little bit about uh, your background as a clinical psychologist and why this really is a, a modality that you have landed on in such a significant way. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if I'm completely honest, it sort of stumbled upon me. And it was honestly something I was really skeptical about. Um, it was about just over 10 years ago. And I was, you know, I was a new psychologist at the time practicing in a clinic using the normal modalities we use, you know, talk therapy assessments, um, you know, those type of typical treatments, you know, people think of when they think of psychology. And, um, you know, a colleague of mine introduced me to the idea of neural feedback. I had never heard about it before. Uh, and my initial reaction was, you know, what is this thing? You know, it, it sort of sounds like this, you know, treatment that might not be real. It, you know, might not have backing in research. Um, you know, this idea that there was a treatment that we could directly train our brains to make changes. So I was extremely skeptical, but um, she invited me to a training. Uh, and I went just because I trusted her and I respected her. And, you know, at first I was blown away by what I learned, what I learned about how it works, um, what I learned about, you know, the different populations it can work with. I mean, it's, you know, it, it really can help the brain make changes at any almost any age. And so I was curious after the training. I wasn't sure of it yet by any means. Um, at the time, I was practicing with a variety of, you know, of different groups of people, individuals. Um, but a lot of my specialty at the time was actually trauma and particularly with soldiers. And, um, you know, a lot of them do struggle. They struggle with normal talk therapy. Um, their bodies and their brains have this hypervigilance and fight and flight reaction that they really have a hard time toning down. So, um, I sort of added it in, asked some of my my clients if they were, you know, interested in trying this new modality. I still didn't necessarily believe, you know, that it could or would work for them. And I have to say, I was absolutely blown away um, with the results that I that I received with them. Uh, and they were as well. I mean, it, it was sort of an experiment because uh, at the time it wasn't as popular as, you know, it is now. And so um, it what I think what blew me away was that not only were my clients able to make changes that, you know, they found difficult to make without the neural feedback, you know, regulating their anxiety reactions, regulating even their thought patterns, um, regulating um, their emotions. But what was most fascinating to me is I actually learned more about my clients because it's so founded in biology uh, and research. And so when my clients would report a symptom while I had them connected with, you know, EEG electrodes, I would learn more about what that meant. You know, when we all use the word anxiety, but what actually is that in the brain? And it can be different things. So we actually became better able to target the right symptoms, help our clients in the right way. So it started off as this, you know, sort of thing, I, as I put my hands up in quotations um, and kind of through just some, uh, you know, clients that were willing to try it with me, it blew me away. And so I integrated it more and more into my practice and, you know, and then just realized that I couldn't imagine practicing without it. You know, I really could get changes um, that, you know, that you know, we could get more changes with the addition of neurofeedback. So I eventually opened up one clinic and now I have multiple clinics um, because it's just so effective for for a lot of different people. Okay, so what is neurofeedback? <laughs> sure, you know what? That's a really good question. Maybe I should have started there. No, it's perfect. So, I know because now I'm like sitting here. I'm with like total bated breath. I was like, I want to know more. So what what is it? So neurofeedback is um, essentially it's a form of biofeedback. Biofeedback is when we are given our biological information, you know, about our bodies, and we use that information to make bodily changes. So there, it can be in more simple formats like temperature biofeedback. It's used actually for things like anxiety, you know, put a ther thermometer on someone's finger. Uh, and then you can actually teach them using that biological feedback, which is their temperature, how to change the temperature of their fingers. And that actually improves autonomic nervous system function and improves anxiety. Uh, one of the, you know, one of the reasons it's used for, but there's muscle biofeedback 
neurofeedback, there's galvanic skin reaction, there's a few different forms. Neurofeedback is essentially EEG biofeedback. So what we do is we have sensors on the brain or on the scalp, I should say, which are reading the EEG activity, um, which is all the electrical activity. So every time our neurons are firing, I mean, and we have you know, like a hundred billion neurons in our brains that are, you know, firing um, depending on the location, activity, depending what we're doing, what we're thinking. And um, when they fire, they release some electrical energy. So every time that's released, we record that in the EEG. Now, we know from years and years of data collection what healthy EEGs look like. And we've been able to map on many different symptoms and experiences to the EEG. So when someone has anxiety, you know, it's certain there's different types of anxiety, but one of them is an excess of some fast wave activity. So if we're doing neurofeedback, we'll find, you know, through our assessment where that anxiety is located in their brain and the treatment will actually put a sensor over their scalp at that location. Um, and they're looking at a computer screen. So they're looking at a screen and we ask them to get something to work on that screen like a game. Maybe move the spaceship or move the object. Um, but what's fascinating and most fascinating to the clients when they start the process is there is no controller. Um, that ask that we have, which is move that spaceship, is entirely controlled by the EEG recording that we're taking. So if those fast frequency waves are you know high, that spaceship's not going to move. But if their brain can learn to bring them down, it's going to start moving. Um, and what's, again, so intriguing about this process to most people is that their brains learn. I mean, we have this beautiful thing that we've all heard, you know, which is neuroplasticity, which is our brain just always has that capacity to make changes. It actually doesn't take long for the brain to learn what to do to get that spaceship to move. And we tighten that over time. So we make it, you know, as the brain catches on, we ask more of it and we ask more of it. Um, and it just continues to learn until we hit the, you know, the markers that we're looking for. Um, and that's, you know, that's a kind of a, I would say, uh, some of the simplistic way of describing it. I mean, we can do a lot more complicated things with neurofeedback. Um, you know, it's not just about raising or lowering certain frequencies. I mean, we can enhance neural pathways, you know, really improving healthy connections in the brain, forging some connections that might not, even, you know, might not be there or, or be too weak. Um, there's a lot of different areas that we can work in. Um, so it's a direct treatment of the brain. Um, but in particular, it's a training approach. One of the um one of the therapists that worked in my practice uh, would always talk about the fact that it's easier to build new neuronal pathways than it is to break them down. And so when you're when you're working with individuals who've experienced trauma, for example, is what you're trying to do build out new neuronal pathways or are are you actually trying to disconnect some of the associations that they had with their trauma or neither? Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, it could be. And, and that's the, the thing when you're doing true, you know, clinical neurofeedback is we customize any, you know, treatment to an individual. Um, so we do that based on their symptoms. And then we would do that based on their EEG data, which we've collected. Um, and it can be so we definitely can help forge new connections, but we also can change um, pathways or connections. So for example, um, you know, for people that have had concussions, so, you know, maybe not just trauma, but concussions, they can get this some over connectivity where the connections actually become too strong. So just like you're referring to, um, you know, with some trauma reactions. And so we can actually help the brain, um, you know, decrease the over connectivity. Um, but it's not necessarily just stopping the connection. We we actually are teaching the brain to forge a healthier connection. Um, so forging the right speeds, the right relationships and the pathways. Um, so it is, you know, a little bit of both, if that makes sense. So how does it how does it actually work to do that? Like what is actually happening on a physiological or anatomical level to facilitate those changes? 
Yeah, so it really is using the EEG data. So that's the electrical activity. So, um, you know, if we have the sensors on the head, whatever our treatment target is, we are, we know based on databases, uh, you know, of what healthy activity looks like. So we're using those numbers, those statistics to reach the targets. So for example, if we have connections we're trying to forge, we would have multiple sensors on the head and we know the relationships between the different cell groupings and locations that we're trying to achieve. Uh, and we can actually through, it's through mathematical formulas, we actually can use that instead of just this needs to go up or this needs to go down, it would be using those mathematical formulas to say, okay, when this relationship between these two areas is reached, the reward will happen. Um, and when it's not reached or it's too low or too high, the reward stops essentially, and, and that would be the game working or not working. Um, but again, it depends on what we're targeting because, you know, for trauma, a lot of times that the amygdala, the fight and flight reaction is, you know, really on overdrive. And, and like you said, some of those reactions are really really embedded in their memories, hippocampus function. Um, so we might directly target those areas and actually help the brain learn to decrease um, some of that, you know, activity that's there because the increase could be what is, um, you know, depending on the person, what is causing some of the symptoms they're experiencing. Um, so it really does vary. It's very customized for, the, for each client. And then when you are working with an individual, and we're looking at this from a really pragmatic perspective, and I'm loving this conversation, by the way, because it, it, it's, it's just a totally <laughs> new lens and opportunity to learn about how some of these things work. If, if you are working with a client and you have the opportunity to do neurofeedback on them, are we really looking at a situation where now we're able to accelerate uh, what could happen with talk therapy alone because we have these two pieces working in conjunction with one another? Or do you use neurofeedback as a completely independent uh, modality. You know, I can be either. I mean, I look at, I mean, I do both in my practice. Um, so I look at it as almost like top down or bottom up processing or, you know, inside out, outside in where, you know, the talk therapy is really helping somebody understand themselves, help them make changes, learn new skills. The neurofeedback is going more underneath. It's going at the biology um, where it's actually helping the brain and the nervous system develop regulation. So both together is phenomenal um, and it really does enhance each other. Um, and a lot of our clients will say, actually, once they start neurofeedback, Feedback. They do feel like more associ associations, more connections, like more change just sort of happens um, along with the work that they're doing. But it also is a standalone, um, you know, so we we can use it to treat various conditions like trauma, anxiety, depression, um, concussions, you know, concussion injuries, ADHD. So even areas where, you know, psychotherapy doesn't have as strong of effectiveness like a concussion, you know, we can definitely build skills, we can help people cope, help people kind of manage and moderate time. Um, but the neurofeedback can directly target the concussion injury and get those cells to be healthier or the neurons to, you know, produce healthier activity, the connections to be forged in a healthier way. So it definitely is both. It definitely can be both. And if we're looking at something like anxiety or, uh, or depression, which I'm, I'm super excited to start to explore new opportunities to uh, to address that for individuals. I, ironically, we, we just did an interview with um, a genetic expert and we were talking about how do we create customized and individualized approaches to anxiety and depression. And so when we're talking about those populations, what can one expect in terms of, of a timeline of change? Or is this is this a, a form of, of treatment or support that one can expect to be engaged with for an extended period of time? What does it look like for, for the average person? Yeah, I, and it varies. And this is where the assessment kind of comes in. So it definitely is not a quick, you know, answer. Uh, if that makes sense. It's not, you know, like a medication that you take a pill and you might notice some effects relatively quickly. It's definitely brain training and brain treatment. Um, so most people that start treatment, you know, they'll notice something, uh, you know, in the first few weeks, some treatments can take a little bit longer than that, but it's a very, very gradual build, um, meaning that as your brain is learning to make that change mildly at first, but as your brain masters it, we, of course, then 
ask it to do more. So every time we're asking the brain to make a little bit more change, a little bit more movement, you're going to notice more. So the majority of people that do our treatment would, I would say, would be in coming in. uh, The frequencies can vary, um, but they're usually coming to the clinic for around six months. Um, Again, that could be once a week, twice a week, every second week. It really depends on the approach that we're that we're taking um, and what we're targeting. But what the beautiful thing about neurofeedback is that, you know, based on the research done so far and based on my clinical experiences, but many who have been doing it even longer than than I have, is that those effects tend to stick. You know, there's evidence, you know, accumulating that there's long-term change. So we don't get clients coming back once they're done their treatment. You know, we've had, you know, you know, many different clients. We've had somebody that had anxiety for 15 years tried every treatment out there in terms of counseling, medication, self-care, health, diet, all of that. Um, And, you know, within three months of neurofeedback, her symptoms, you know, reduced by half and she was able to go off of medication, um, you know, in conjunction with her, her physician, go off medication and then now is done treatment and is doing extremely well. Um, So we tend to see that. And even in um, research trials that have compared, you know, even something for like ADHD, looking at medication in a group of kids or medication with neurofeedback, so combined treatment. They actually have some research that shows that those two groups fare very well. Actually, they both get better. Um, But if you remove the medication and then remove neurofeedback, um, the ones that did neurofeedback sustain the gains. They maintain them even when they stop the treatment, even when they've stopped the medication. Um, So it's definitely... I think the, you know, the people that do neural feedback are looking for that long term change. That's what they want. I love that. And I think it's so exciting, especially in the realm of something like uh, ADD or ADHD for children. And I would suspect because their brains are in a different place than an adult's in terms of that, that neuroplasticity, that if we're able to support them with neurofeedback early in their lives, um, I would suspect that it would have uh, longstanding um, results in a totally different way than you would see in adults. Yeah, well, and we get, I mean, I couldn't even say from research or my experience that there's a difference in terms of the results that we see. But if just like you're saying, I mean, when you when you affect that change that young, I mean, it really changes the course of their life. And I've, you know, heard that feedback many times from parents that, you know, they just, they cannot believe the amount of changes, you know, their child is calmer, mo- more focused, their emotional regulation is healthier. You know, we've, tr- we treat, um, you know, and help uh, functioning with autism as well. I've had kids that weren't uh, talking, you know, develop language. And there's some beautiful things that, you know, neural feedback has helped kids achieve. And so when they get those changes that early, you know, it just changes the course of their life for sure. Um, and I mean, from my own personal experience, if I can add in, I mean, to be on board certified in neural feedback, to be board certified, you have to successfully do your own treatment. Um, and it's, you know, and it's meant mentored um, by experts in the field. And um, I've done neural feedback myself. You know, I've seen the changes that happen with it. And it's neural feedback, if you've done it, it's very hard to describe what you're doing and what you've achieved. But I can, you know, from my own experience, say my brain and my body are healthier. I just have an awareness of my brain and my EEG that I never knew existed before I did it. So I did many sessions, you know, over, you know, it was about six months to a year because it was in my clinic. So I had access to it. So um, I kind of kept on the treatment a little bit longer, just out of interest and, and desire. And but by the time I was done my treatment, I just I knew what my EEG felt like. I can feel when my fast waves get faster. I can feel when my slower waves are a little bit too dominant. And I can just sort of take a moment and find their balance. Uh, And that's so empowering. I mean, I don't think that I would be where I am in my life if I hadn't found that internal sense of regulation. It really, I would say, changed the course of my life. Um, And we've seen that, you know, neurofeedback is for, you know, different clinical groups, but we, we do work with athletes, CEOs, doctors that are just trying to, you know, manage that work life balance, manage stress, optimize their performance so that they're just feeling better. You know, their productivity is high. They're, they're just more satisfied with their overall, 
um, kind of feeling in life. Um, and so it, it really can be used for a variety of reasons and areas. And when, this is so fascinating to me. And so when, you know, and I love hearing your own experience with it uh, as well, because I think it provides such a unique insight to it. And when we're looking and speaking to this notion of performance, uh, in particular in adults, is that a matter of, oh, I have more awareness and I change my behavior in response to my brain's overactivity? Or, and maybe it's both, have we also increased the capacity of the brain in some way? Yes, definitely both. Absolutely both. Um, so there are, I mean, we can, there's certain ratios in the brain of different speeds of activity that if in the right range or ratio, um, we can improve spatial skills, reaction time, um, you know, a variety of things that, you know, speaks directly often to athletes that are, you know, wanting to optimize their own performance. So there is a little bit of awareness that they can learn. But when that ratio can, you know, can forge that change, and they they will see even without any, um, you know, explicit attempt to make change, implicitly, automatically, their brain is already operating at a better efficiency. Um, and that's what happens. And so the training is not all conscious. So there are conscious elements that are learned, um, but there is a lot of implicit learning where the brain is learning and adapting to the targets without you even realizing what you're doing. Um, so there are a lot of changes that happen that, you know, clients will report, I'm so much more focused. I'm noticing my body is less stressed. I'm able to, you know, produce more. I've had all these things going on in my mind and all these to-do lists and, you know, all these things that need to be done. And now I just seem to be getting them out there more. When I'm with my kids, I'm more present now. You know, they just, these things just start to happen even without necessarily um, that full conscious awareness. But the conscious awareness does come and can come um, as well for people. So it's definitely both. It's so interesting because as you're, as you were saying that too, I was sitting here, I, I wrote down, I suspect the, the oh, I, I know the, the brain is learning subconsciously, regardless of whether we bring a level of awareness to it or, yes. or not. Um, and it, yes. it sounds like one of these things, like one of the virtues of, of doing the neurofeedback is that you actually now have a filter of awareness related to some of that unconscious learning. Exactly. I mean, if, you know, if I throw out there a question of, tell me what your brain feels like, <laughs> you know, most people don't know the answer to that, right? It's not something we really think about unless we're having a headache or we're feeling stressed. We might then use a word like that. But day to day, tell me what your brain feels like. Gauge it to me just like you would think about temperature. We don't know. We don't have that awareness. Um, and that's the beauty of the biofeedback is, you know, there is implicit learning, but you also kind of get that gauge of how my brain's doing. And so you learn how to operate within the right ratios, within the right numbers, so that you are at your best. Um, and it is, it's lovely. And like I said, from my own experience, I know when my brain is out of its healthy ratio, I can feel that. And that is not something I felt before I did my training. And what happens for those people who sort of have a nondescript experience of they're like, I just have brain fog. Mm -hmm. Is it is it yeah. is it something that people have reported changes on? Yes, absolutely. You know what's really interesting about the phrase brain fog? So it's quite funny that you use that phrase is that's a very specific finding in the brain. There's a certain frequency or speed of activity that when that is elevated, my clients always use that phrase brain fog. I just it's foggy. I just it's like mucking through mud a little bit. It's just not working right. There's just something there. Uh, and it's a certain speed that creates that feeling. Uh, and so, yeah, we absolutely, so we can target that speed to kind of get the balance. Or sometimes what will happen is that, you know, for some people who have brain fog will also notice they have some sensitivities, you know, whether it be to sound, to noise, or just get overstimulated as well. Um, so there's other patterns that, that are linked with that same pattern that we can actually help the brain, again, you know, use different treatment approaches, different options to help that brain fog lift. And absolutely, you know, it's, you know, it's one of the, I have so many, you know, uh, 
stories in my mind about clients that had huge benefits that I get chills sometimes when I think of, like good chills, right? Um, and some of them are those clients that have had that brain fog and they'll just come in one day and tell me it's lifting. Um, and it's just, it has such an impact on their life. I just made a note to myself to to book an appointment at Toronto Neuro, Neurofeedback <laughs> for myself and my husband. But, you know, as a, as a clinician, one of the things that I find is that, you know, women will come in and w- one of many symptoms that they have described is, is brain fog. And we will do objective yeah. testing and we'll be like, listen, you know, this is what's happening hormonally and this is going on. And it, it explains mm-hmm. so much of these symptoms. And we and we change those things and we go back and we look at those objective levels that have changed. And I actually often find that the brain fog is one of those residual pieces. Um, yeah. Similar to uh, similar to inflammation, where it's almost like the body has not received the memo that the cause of the inflammation or the cause yes. of the brain fog has changed. And so as you were describing this, I was thinking about probably hundreds of patients um, who are like, OK, great, like great, Megan, that this all looks good on, on paper. <laughs> um, but like th- the main thing I want to I, I want to address is still hanging out there. Um, and so, you know, I'm I'm fascinated whether that's an observation that you have seen as well, that, you know, sometimes it's just a matter of being able to tell the brain you don't you don't need to hang out in that space anymore we're we're just going to clear this for you yeah so it's so interesting so without a doubt i mean everything's connected to the brain right so i mean based on you would know based on your experiences um we see it in the research literature you know if you eat um, in a healthier way, more nutritious way, certain types of, you know, minerals and vitamins that we need, your brain is healthier. When you exercise, your brain is healthier. There's beautiful research to show how exercise impacts brain development and brain functioning. You know, there's lots of things out there. Hormones, you know, like you mentioned, I mean, all of these things are connected to brain function. If certain areas of your brain aren't operating in, you know, their optimal capacity, it's going to going to affect hormone production. It's going to affect cognitive performance. It's going to affect emotions. Um, So absolutely. And what I find interesting is the the particular frequencies I'm referring to for brain fog is they usually fall in something called alpha rhythm. Um, And now alpha is normally a really good, you know, frequency of activity to be in when you want to meditate, when you want to relax, you know, when you want to just reflect and feel good, you know, boosting alpha activity is lovely and lots of treatments target it. Um, so even something like GABA activity, um, GABA, you know, supplements um, can really help with alpha. But what's interesting is that if your brain starts to produce too much alpha, you get brain fog. Um, And so it's sometimes what I notice is that um, all these, you know, all the things that people are doing that are right, everything they're doing that's right is helping them and their brain is healing and it's regulating the activity and it's giving them more alpha so they feel better. Um, But if there's a little bit too much alpha residually that's left and their brain continues to produce it, that's when we tend to see the brain fog continue. At least that's my experiences, but I've seen it so many times. And, you know, especially like you said with women, I mean, there's a profile I've seen. It's not yet in the research literature, but I've seen it many times now um, and would like to get it out there um, for more people to understand is there is a burnt out brain profile that I've seen, you know, where the brain does kind of for, you know, busy, busy moms, busy, you know, um, families, parents, uh, but particularly the women that are working and trying to do it all, right? There's so many of us out there like that, um, is that you know, the brain functions really well for a long time, but at some point, sometimes it just burns out. And and that's not just a feeling. That's not just a, oh, I'm feeling burnt out. I've actually been able to see what that looks like in the brain. And the brain actually kind of starts to go into a little bit of its own shell and it starts to decrease its activity. It will reduce sometimes its alpha activity. I've seen that quite a bit. And it's almost going into this energy conservation mode. Uh, and it's fascinating when I see see that because the first thing that we need to do is actually get their alpha up again. Um, And once we can get their alpha up, then we can start working on on other things. But of course, everything else, supplement, diet, exercise, all the self-care and other, you know, naturopathic remedies are going to fit into that for them as well. What about its influence on sleep? Mm Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So sleep, is, you know, when we think about sleep, how many of us 
have either gone through periods where we've had horrible sleep or have experienced it for a long time that it's just our new normal. So sleep is one of those funny things in the brain where it is you know, it is found in a particular, again, the correct ratio of speeds. If you have too much of a certain speed, your effect, your your sleep is going to be affected. If you have too little, your sleep is going to be affected. And so um, it's so easy. It's one of the first things that go when we're stressed, when we're depressed, when we're not eating well, when we're, you know, just got too much going on. Because if your brain's overstimulated, it will start to produce too much fast activity. And that balance of balance will affect the brain's ability to shift through the stages of sleep. When you are are the opposite action. Your brain's producing too much slow activity. So this could be things like depression or even ADHD. Um, then your brain actually is operating at too slow a frequency. So your sleep maintenance is going to be affected. So you're going to be waking up or not sleeping as deeply as you want. And we definitely see if your brain's not getting through the stages of sleep in a healthy way, even your, your sense of how well you slept is going to be affected. Um, so sleep is actually one of the first things that people often notice when they do neurofeedback, whether or not that is even what they came for, um, is it's usually one of the first symptoms that they notice improve. So as your brain starts to regulate, the most common improvements we see up front are improved focus and improved sleep. You, again, even if that's not the target, usually the targets come a little bit later, but that balance of the ratios of, of speeds will actually improve focus and sleep um, pretty quickly for a lot of people. Yeah. I feel like I'm sitting here and I could just keep like firing conditions and specifics at you and go, what about this? What about this? Uh, one question I am curious about, because I do recognize that so many of these patterns actually emanate from the brain. Uh, and that is chronic pain. Is yes, that something you've yes. seen an influence on? Yeah, we have. And, um, you know, there is some research out there looking at the EEG, the brain, chronic pain, and there are different networks mapped in the brain that link to chronic pain. There is still a lot of research being um, done in the area. So we have a lot more to learn yet. Um, but we definitely have some of it mapped. And so there are some different patterns where we'll see the network, you know, the pain network, there's a pain network in the brain, right? And again, there's more than one. Um, but we can we actually can if sometimes see that the pain network's not functioning well. So it's either overstimulated, understimulated, the connectivity in the network is not where we want it to be. The regions in the network aren't, you know, healthy in terms of their arousal patterns. Um, and then we also see certain, you know, speeds of activity that are linked with um, pain conditions in different, you know, different areas, different symptoms. So it is quite complex. Again, there's a lot of research going on there, but um, we do we do treat it, and we we have many different options when it comes to chronic pain. So we can train the brain, just like I explained, but we also have something called PEMF, which is pulse electromagnetic frequency um, therapies, where it actually generates a particular frequency. And there's lots out there, um, you know, that can can show that certain frequencies can actually stimulate different, you know, reactions in the body. So whether or not we're treating the brain or treating the body, there's um, some beautiful research out there that can improve the experience of pain in different layers, you know, whether it be um, the symptoms are coming from different parts of their body, different layers when it comes to even different types of pain, right? Whether it be um, more nerve related or more musculoskeletal, but absolutely uh, migraines headaches, you know, there's, we do lots of work in those areas because, you know, these are conditions that, you know, are really hard for, for a lot of clients to find treatments that really get, you know, really reduce the symptoms to a place that they're happy. You know, they're often looking at multiple treatments, trying to find a team to help them. And sometimes the normal kind of medical system doesn't offer all of the answers for them. Um, and so there are some beautiful options for them for sure. I'm finding this so fascinating. And one of the things I promised you as we were getting started is I said, oh, it's going to be very conversational. Um, <laughs> and then here I am just like one word questions that are really statements. Um, but I, I really do. I really do find this fascinating. And I think it, it it sort of underscores this this notion that so many of the things that manifest in us uh, physically are really emanating um, from patterns that are existing in the, in the brain for 
any number of, of reasons. And one of the things I find so exciting about this conversation and the idea of neurofeedback in general is it hands us back this capacity to have control over something that had for the longest time, I think for most people, been sort of off limits in terms of their ability to take any level of of not necessarily responsibility for, but action towards. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I I do find this exciting. Sorry, go ahead, Michelle. No, no, that's okay. I was just wanting to add, because it came to mind that, um, you know, when a client begins neurofeedback um, is there's always an initial assessment process where we get to know the client and then they're going to undergo a QEG. So it's a quantitative EEG, essentially a brain mapping, but it is the gold standard of brain mappings um, where we really look at their at their brain. We're looking at the electrical activity, looking at, you know, where all the health is, where the areas are that maybe, you know, we need to target. Um, and when they get those results, they get to see images, you know, in in some ways similar to MRI images or CT scans where certain areas are kind of lit up in different colors. They're, the QEG, we can do conversions where we produce um, the activity in these color-coded images. And I have to say that, you know, that just the assessment itself has been so validating for so many clients I've seen over the years because for some conditions, you know, whether or not we're talking about depression, anxiety, trauma, chronic pain, you know, concussions, a lot of what they're enduring is an internal experience that there is no, you know, test that they just, you know, take this blood test and it's positive and oh, there you go, there's your depression or there's your chronic pain. Um, a lot of them have these experiences where they're questioning themselves or they feel questioned by other practitioners. So I find when they go through, and I don't know if you have the same experience, Megan, with the work that you do, where you get to do this test and then you get to say, oh, look, here it is. This is what's out of balance. This is why you have this symptom of chronic pain or anxiety or whatever it might be. Um, And it is just so validating for them to actually see it in their brain in an image um, that it is, I think it instills hope and empowerment that they now have the ability to make that change. I have seen it. I have seen it uh, hundreds of times, which is why uh, I'm such an advocate for people to learn more about the different mechanisms and entry points with respect to their to their health and to advocate for it um, and mm-hmm. to ask about it and uh, and that's what I really love about this conversation today is because I think it's it's opening up for people an entirely new realm of possibility that they can start to look at on two sides one potentially managing something that has been chronic for them maybe depression maybe anxiety maybe something else but also for those individuals who are like listen like my doctor is respectfully less than helpful when I walk in and say I've got brain fog going on or my naturopath is less than helpful when I say I've got uh, brain fog going on. So, you know, it, we really know so so little and so much about the body at the at the same time that I think this is a, a really exciting um, new place that people can uh, can explore. Yeah, and I think too that you know, it's um, in the medical system, we're in a world where medication is the option, right? And I think that we've seen in recent years a real shift coming from everybody where, um, yes, there's absolutely times medications are needed. Absolutely. But there are lots of people, lots of parents um, that are looking for other options, are looking for, you know, what they would consider more natural forms of treatment um, or just overall all like a holistic approach to their bodies to their minds um, and I think that that's where you know all I think in the world right now at least in North America there are there really is that interest and the brain is so big right now right I mean since the 90s we've learned so much about the brain so you know people want their brains to be healthier people are looking at their diets and you know exercise and different options to to increase their brain's capacity or improve its health and so I think it's so nice to be able to have those options out there to be able to say, look, if you want these, you can have these are all the options, right? Whether it be medication, whether it be different forms of alternative treatments, whether it be um, neural feedback is one of them. Yeah, it's a fantastic. And when all we have are hammers, everything is a nail. So uh, this just is another piece that people can put into the into the arsenal of their um, of their care. 
Before we jump into the rapid fire questions, I want to take a moment to talk to you about Fullscript. Fullscript is a virtual dispensing platform that helps practitioners, myself included, dispense professional grade supplements and improve patient adherence from anywhere. It has the industry's most comprehensive catalog of products, has features like refill reminders and auto reorder, and even sends medically reviewed wellness content to patients on your behalf. I've been using Fullscript in my practice for years, so I have first-hand knowledge of the impact it can have on your patients and your business. First of all, it's super simple to use and loaded with features. Features like EHR integrations, customizable dosage instructions, and an evidence-based protocol library. It makes integrative medicine feel, well, integrated. It incorporates itself into your way of working, with your approach to wellness even as that evolves, and most importantly, with your patients' day-to-day lives. As someone wanting to address patient adherence, eliminate inventory management, and earn more revenue for your practice, you really should give Fullscript a try. If you're a practitioner looking to sign up, go to fullscript.com forward slash walker to start using Fullscript for free today. And if you're a patient currently ordering supplements from your doctor, let them know about Fullscript. Tell them I sent you. Uh, Michelle, I feel like this is a really perfect place to transition uh, the interview. And as I mentioned to you, I have a component of the interview. I call them our KPIs or key performance indicators. So just like we have them in our business, I believe that we have them in how we live our life as well. And so I've got a series of rapid fire questions coming your way. I will do my best to answer rapidly. (laughs) Is your brain ready for it? Okay. I will do my best. Yes. First one. What's the most impactful book or reading that you've come across during the pandemic? Oh, that's really interesting. Um, Oh, I read so much and I read a lot of real technical books. Um, And I'm not good at names either. Um, Let me think here of something I've been reading. Um, There is um, there's Deepak Chopra um, reads uh, has written some interesting books, and I actually reread an old one of his called "The Spontaneous Fulfillment of Desire," Um, and it's sort of the reminder that you know there are these synchronicities in life, and sometimes you just got to listen to the universe. He's always full of wisdom. (laughs) What is the one thing you are most consistent with with respect to your health? Um, Diet, actually. I approach every day as how can I feed my body and brain. So I let myself eat other stuff at times, but I always make sure I'm nourishing my body and brain. What is something totally badass about you that people would not (laughs) otherwise know? Um, So my uh, husband uh, rides a motorcycle and I absolutely love being on the back of a Harley. (laughs) That that is pretty. That is pretty (laughs) badass. We will hand that to you. What do you do for fun or play? Um, So I'm uh, big into nature, walks, uh, rollerblading, motorcycling. Really like to be outside. And finally for you, entrepreneurism. Are we born this way or do we learn to become entrepreneurs? I think we're born this way. Yeah, I mean, I think it evolves, but I think there's something in our nature right from the get go. And I think many of us feel like we just had that an instinct or an inner feeling that we that we needed to do something big, something more grow something. So yeah, I think born this way. Dr. Michelle Presniak, such a fascinating conversation. Where can we send people to learn more about what you are up to? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I do, we do have our Toronto clinic, um, which is www.torontoneurofeedback.ca. And uh, I also have drpresniak.com that they can go to to learn more. Amazing. And we're going to hook everyone up in there in our show notes. Thank you so much for taking the time to have this conversation today. Well, thank you so much, Megan. It is a pleasure to be talking with you. The Anthropology Podcast is about leveling up your mindset, your health, and your business so you can maximize your impact in this world. To that end, we're going to begin with a new series of offerings to help you have that impact you've always dreamed of. Over on the Anthropology Podcast page, we're going to start doing live broadcasts 
of episodes. Sometimes these will be solo episodes and sometimes these will be with guests. This is your opportunity to interact with us live as we are recording your favorite episodes. Adjacent to our Facebook page, we also have the Anthropology Collective, a free Facebook group with hundreds of fellow entrepreneurs just like you. In the Anthropology Collective, we're going to keep you up to date on upcoming masterclasses, interact daily, as well as have new offerings like our badass book club. After a two year hiatus, we are bringing it back. Our new April and May selections are going to be announced in the coming weeks, and we would love for you to participate in all of these new virtual offerings. I believe that when people have their health, they can change the world. That is what inspired us to start this podcast in the first place. And that is what is inspiring us to keep going. I'm so appreciative of all of you. Give us a like over on Apple iTunes and come and join us in the collective. We'll see you there.